Epigenetics has become a great business to be in for someone trying to improve the care of cancer patients for really two applications. The first is that we and many others have developed very sensitive, specific, robust ways to detect these changes, kind of like CSI, but now looking for cancer, to detect these kind of changes in body fluids and tissues and the like that will, we believe in the end, will improve screening, early detection, um, the accuracy of a diagnosis and the like. So that's become a whole enterprise. And one of the genes we very first discovered to be epigenetically silenced, after really quite a long time, has actually now become a laboratory diagnostic test, certified, approved, etc. for a very specific purpose. It's for a man who's had uh, a prostate biopsy, so somebody suspected prostate cancer might be present, but he's uh, not detected the cancer on a biopsy. They haven't detected it, so-called a negative biopsy. But there's still a lot of worry that they may have missed the cancer when they stuck the needle in. And the question for the clinician is often, who should we biopsy again in three months, and who can we let loose for a while, watch their serum prostate-specific antigen, PSA, and the like? Who, who, do we, who can we lay off for a while? And this is a very common problem, actually, in clinical practice. And what they found is if you have this epigenetic change that we typically find in a cancer already in one of these biopsies, that that man should be biopsied again soon. It's not uh, that research was not what we did, that actually we passed that off to a commercial enterprise, so they did all that research. So I should say at the outset that if it is very successful and makes a gazillion dollars, I get somewhat less than a gazillion dollars myself and our institution was. But that kind of handoff to a commercial enterprise to develop a product, that's not what we do, but we try to be the beginning of that. Can we develop a new idea, a new strategy that can be suitable to be a product and then deliver it to the people who make products and tests and whatnot? The other aspect of epigenetics that's become very exciting very recently is because there isn't a change in a gene sequence with an epigenetic defect, there's the possibility that you might be able to re-sculpt the chromatin there with a drug, perhaps, to restore gene function or regulated gene function in a rational kind of therapy mode. And so uh, there are a few inhibitors of epigenetic uh, enzymes that are now working their way into clinical trials and a couple even into FDA approval that can restore the expression of genes that have been epigenetically silenced. And so a lot of our laboratory work has been directed at discovering new kinds of drugs and new targets to help push this uh, area along. I can't tell you which of these drugs are going to be effective and which combinations. That's a wide open field right now. Great, great field to jump into. Um, and we just don't know enough even about the drugs we have and how they work. And I think we're going to discover more and more. And uh, hopefully we can discover them in such a way that we can be efficient about finding which ones are helpful, who they can treat, what combinations we can use, design smart clinical trials to test this very quickly, faster time, less investment in monies, and, and get these things out to people who need these kind of treatments a little faster. And I think that's the... Uh, that's the real goal of what people have called translational research. Can we refine these processes to get the, the things that work more quickly into the clinic and discard the things that don't work a little, a little bit more rapidly?